Hello, everyone. I'm Robert Urbina, Water Management Specialist here at Coachella Valley Water District. Welcome to our Growing Vegetables in Time for the Holiday Dinners webinar. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them in the, bo in the box in the corner, I mean in the bottom of the screen, and we'll answer them after the presentation. Or you can email us at publicinfo at cbwd.org. So now let's learn about our speaker. Don is a water management supervisor for Coachella Valley Water District. His primary responsibility is, is to provide technical support for efficient water use throughout the district. He works with residential, commercial, and recreational water users to improve their water efficient landscape irrigation practices. He holds a Master of Science degree in Agriculture Education with a minor in Crop Science and is also a registered certified crop advisor. Before coming to CBWD, he was also adjunct agriculture professor at College of the Desert for 20 years, where he taught both home gardening and environmental gardening classes. Don has a total of 33 years of experience in irrigation and agriculture education at the college level. Please welcome Mr. Don Ackley. Good, I guess it's still, no, good noon everybody. Uh, welcome to the seminar. Uh, really happy that, that you joined us here. And uh, I just want to tell you right off, this is tricky business. Uh, when I was teaching at the College of the Desert, I would challenge my students to say, okay, pick a week, sometime in advance, and then um, come up with a menu and Buy your seeds and your, and your vegetables, etc., for a dinner 60 days from now, and grow it in your garden and, and have it ready to go. And so it's a little tricky business, but we'll uh, uh, we'll tell you some tricks to hopefully make you successful. So first of all, a couple of disclaimers. First of all, this is not a general how to grow vegetables course. It's how to grow vegetables in time for the holidays course. But if you need or want some general vegetable growing knowledge here in the desert, you can find that by going to our website, cvwd.org, and access our previous 2017 presentation. And you do this by uh, on the website, on the horizontal bar near the top, click on conservation, and then click on seminars, workshops, and classes, and then click on residential, and then finally click on past workshop materials, and scroll down and you'll find vegetable gardening in the desert, and that will give you information on general vegetable gardening. A couple other dis disclaimers that um, uh, aren't there. Uh, f first of all, a lot of this growing for a specific time has to do with the weather that your plants are growing in. And with climate change uh, and global warming, but global warming doesn't mean that we won't get frost and so on. If you've paid attention the last couple of years, the polar vortex that comes down in the eastern part of the country, you know, all the way down to Texas, I think last year, so um, uh, weather is not as predictable as it could, or as it was in the past. But I think we can work around that just a little bit too. Also, we're on a big time crunch to do this. Uh, I, ideally, I wasn't around when uh, they scheduled this and I was told them we need to schedule this for the first week in, in September, uh, not the last week, because we've just lost about Oh, 25 days or so uh, things, which puts us on a tight schedule, but we can work around that too. Okay, so why should you even do this? I mean, it's just easy to just go, go down to the uh, supermarket and buy the vegetables you want for your dinner. Uh, but there are some big advantages to growing your vegetables uh, yourself. And first of all is variety, variety, variety. You just have a, a massive 
choice between um, uh, from seed catalogs and from uh, um, you know uh, the box stores and nurseries and so on, a much bigger choice than you have at the supermarket. For instance, last night I, I went down just to double check these figures and I looked for sweet corn. And um, when I did that, I found two sweet corns, one f fresh, fresh, and the other one was packaged, two. But then I went to one of my favorite seed catalogs. This is a, a mini plug. This is called a whole seed catalog. And I looked up corn, 13 different varieties, different sizes, shapes, colors, degree of sweetness. So you have a much vaster choice of picking out something that would really uh, satisfy your palate. Second thing is freshness. Uh, most of that sweet corn was grown who knows where, uh, not in your backyard, and it is picked, it is sent to a packing house. A packing house clean, cleans it up, uh, sends it to a distribution center and it packages it. And from, the, from there, it goes to the supermarket where it's displayed. All of this takes 10 days or so uh, and a lot of handling of your vegetables. To grow your own, the only trip is from your backyard to your, your kitchen. And, and so it's as fresh as you can possibly get unless you want to eat it right out there in the garden. Also, uh, taste. Again, the variety makes you able to experiment with uh, carrots. Um, there's different tastes for different types of carrots, sweeter and so on and so forth. So uh, you have much greater variety of tastes to choose from. Um, it's always struck me uh, kind of funny that um, you go there for the lettuce. So go there and you're going to buy some lettuce. So you've got some head lettuce, you've got some romaine, you've got some bib, and uh, but you add them all up together and you've got four or five lettuces that you can pick from or a mixture. But then you move down and go down the aisle to uh, salad dressings. You literally have hundreds of salad dressings to choose from. Four lettuces, but 40 um, salad dressings. And it seems to me that's backwards. We should have 40 different types of lettuce and just a few uh, uh, salads. But that's what we're stuck with. Next thing is exclusiveness. One of the things that we do when, when we have a dinner and we have guests come from, for, for dinner is to make them something special, something just for them, something they can't get anywhere else. And um, you do that by when you serve the, these dishes, this is um, uh, a, a rare uh, sweet corn. Uh, you can't get it at the supermarket. I grew it with my own hands and I prepared it just for you. And that's what we mean by exclusiveness, where you're, you're, you're making something special. You're offering something that they can't get anywhere else. And it makes the dinner a little exciting. And then pesticide-free. I'm not going to go into a whole big thing about pesticides, but if you're concerned about pesticides on your vegetables, grow your own. And then you have the choice of whether or not there's going to be a pesticide applied to it. And finally, and this is the, the crucial thing of what the class is about, why to grow vegetables? Because we can. But only in the desert southwest can we do that. So in most parts of the United States, I was born and raised in Michigan, and uh, uh, we planted uh, in kind of middle, late spring after all danger of frost is gone. So that was usually April-ish. And you planted and you grew the crop over the summer and harvested in the very late summer or early, early fall. And that was it, gardening season is over. Here we can do that, but we also can plant in the fall and harvest in the winter. And uh, that allows us to have fresh vegetables 
with all the advantages I just listed, and, and uh, um, otherwise, you're going to go down to the store and buy commercial vegetables, either foreign or do, do, domestic, and without much of a choice. So these are all good reasons for you to do this. What makes this possible? What makes it possible in the Coachella Valley is we have 330 frost free days. And so uh, the caveat is, is that the, the frost occurs during the holiday season, but we have a long, long growing season, right up there with the highest, longest growing season in, in the nation, probably the world. And we also, even better, get 93% possible sunshine hours in, in a full year. So the sun's pretty much shining all the time out here, and that's what plants need. So always remember, a plant is, first and foremost, always and forever, it's a light-eating machine. That's what plants eat. Now, they need fertilizer and they need water, but it all revolves around light. That's a light eating machine. And all the water and fertilizer in the world will not make up for what you're going to learn about in a minute. This is false diminishing sunlight and cooling temperatures. Therefore, in order to succeed, we must choose our fall vegetables wisely. And this means choosing those vegetables who need the least, the least light to mature. So what knowledge then is essential to successfully growing winter holiday vegetables in the Coachella Valley? And remembering again, plant is first and foremost, always and forever a light eating machine and good gardeners pay attention to light but most people think well i need fertilizer and i need water and yes that that's all true but what drives this is, is light light is the dominating fa factor here today september 29th our plants are receiving 11 hours and 56 minutes of, of sunshine and tomorrow they'll receive about one or two minutes less. And this will happen each day until December 21st, which is the shortest day of the year. By November 21st, which is Thanksgiving, our plants will be receiving 10 hours and 11 minutes of sunshine today. I mean, I'm sorry, in November. By December, they're receiving nine hours and 55 minutes of sunlight. In other words, they've lost one hour and 42 minutes per day by Thanksgiving, and one hour and 42 minutes per day is, is lost by Christmas, and the plants don't like it. In contrast, in the summer, daylight ranges from 14 hours and 18 minutes on June 1st and 12 hours and 55 minutes on August 31st. So you can see the contrast there. Uh, we have much less light in the fall. And this leads to sulking, sulk time. Sulk time. As fall approaches winter, the daylight period shrinks, temperatures drop, and fall annual crops descend into a no-growth funk period. They are not happy about this. It's kind of like chicken litter in the sky falling, but in this case, the sun is disappearing, right? So if you're a plant and, and you're programmed to be planted in the spring, growing into warmer temperatures and longer days, and you find yourself planted in the fall, where it's the opposite, you're growing in the shorter days and cooler temperatures, it's backwards, it's not normal, and it's panic inducing. Like, when is this going to stop? Is the sunlight going to all disappear and we're all doomed? Uh, that's kind of a depressing situation. And, and so they just kind of, oh, what's the use? Just kind of be there. You might try to add water. You might try to add fertilizer. You might try to add more of both. 
because you can detect the fact that these plants aren't growing very fast, etc. And that's not going to help. The cure is the passage of time and the detection of increasing daylight and rising temperatures. And that would be a little bit after uh, December 21st, which is the shortest day of the year. December 22nd is a little bit longer all the way up to, to uh, June 21st, which is the longest day of the year. So the trick to getting a harvest by the holidays is to find a vegetable variety that needs the least amount of sunshine to get to the harvest stage, and that's the one that you want to plant. The magic number to find this information is a vegetable variety with the lowest numbers of something called days to maturity. Days to maturity explained. There's a little controversy over this, but generally it's the time you need to put a plant to reach maturity. If the seed is planted directly in the ground, like you got a carrot seed, then the time to maturity is the time between planting and harvesting the first carrot. Now, some people say it's between the day that you plant the seed until you harvest, and then there's some controversy where they say, no, you have to wait until the plant emerges from the ground. And when you first start seeing the plant come out of the ground, it's from then to harvest. So there's a little confusion on this. When you find this information, is the back of the seed packet or in the seed catalog. It's plant description. Note that this is not exact in its prediction. Cooler, stormy, cloudy days will slow things down, and warm, bright, sunshiny days will speed things up. But what the day to maturity vegetables comparison is, is that it that days of maturity will re reliably identify those plants who need less sunshine to reach maturity than similar ones, similar varieties of plants who need more. So when you go to pick up your plant or your seed packet, instead of looking at the pretty pictures, turn it over and read about cultural practices back and you'll have found there a sentence saying, average days to maturity is. And you sort of compare those. Forget the pictures. Compare days to maturity and look for the one that's got the lowest number of days to maturity. And if you're looking to speed things up, especially in the fall, that is the one you want to plant. So what vegetables can you grow in the fall in the Coachella Valley? And the answer to that is virtually all of them. So cool season vegetables, warm season vegetables, and then oddballs that kind of fall in, in between. Um, uh, the thing about this is that you can grow, grow them all, but you need to pay attention especially to frost, right? So let's go through these just as a reminder of what, which plants are cool and which ones are warm season. So, Characteristics of cool season vegetables. First and foremost, right up there with like they're frost tolerant. So if the temperature drops below freezing, these plants can usually shrug it off unless it gets way below freezing, like in the teens. So if it drops to 28 degrees, you'll see the frost on the plants. Frost will melt and the plant will just keep, keep growing. Secondly, of equal importance, is that you harvest on the cool season vegetables, a root, a stalk, a leaf, or an immature inflorescence. Inflorescence is scientific ease for flower. I've always loved that name, inflorescence. So you can impress your friends by talking about what a nice inflorescence that is. Um, but the thing about this is that 
because you eat part of the plant instead of a fruit, it's got a shorter growing season. So we've got 35 to 75 days uh, um, on these plants before they're ready to eat. We generally plant these between September and February. And note, if you didn't do the math already from my previous thing, the number of days between September 29th and Thanksgiving, so between today and Thanksgiving is 57 days. And between now and Christmas, it's 87 days. So that's our time window. And that's a little bit of a time crunch for us to do this. So vegetable root crops, these are the cool season crops. So the carrots and the beets and the onions and radishes and rutabagas and turnips and uh, the, the whole, whole shebang. And you think basically, well, you're eating the root. The leaf crops. So these are kind of vitamin factories. So uh, the lettuces, uh, spinach, Swiss chard, uh, anything that you eat the leaves of are um, uh, the cool season crops. And then the cool crops. These are big guys. These are big plants. Uh, broccoli, uh, cabbage, cauliflower, uh, uh, Brussels sprouts, uh, kohlrabi, and kale. So these are big plants. And because they're big plants, just an aside here, they are heavy feeders. So you have to pre-plant, put fertilizer down before you plant the plant. And you're going to have to add a couple side dressings during the growing season of nitrogen. And, and lastly, one, one more aside. See the cauliflower up there in the right-hand corner. Nice white cauliflower. It doesn't grow that way naturally. What you have to do is blanch the plant. So when that cauliflower head's about half grown, you take those big elephant ear leaves on the side of the plant and fold them over and cover the cauliflower head and therefore keep light from directly hitting the cauliflower and it will stay white. If you don't do that, then you get chlorophyll green inside the head and you'll have a green cauliflower instead of the white one that we're all used to. So about when they're about halfway formed, you just flop those leaves all over it, put a rubber band or something around it so that uh, it's black from the sunlight and you'll have nice white cauliflower. Then we have the stock crop and um, Swiss chard is also a bit of, of a, a um, stock crop, but celery is definitely the, the stock crop and kind of the same thing happens there. You notice the bottom of the celery plant, you know how it's kind of white and then as you get closer and closer to the top, it gets greener and greener and that's a different taste than the white at the bottom. And that again is chlorophyll. So what you do with the celery is as it's growing, it's about halfway grown, is you mound up soil. You take some of that soil on the side and, and push it up and cover the, the bottom maybe four inches of the celery plant. And again, that blocks sunlight, chlorophyll goes away or doesn't even form, and then you, your celery is white and, and less bitter tasting than on up the plant. So these are just little, little uh, tricks in there for you. Okay, kind of a oddball are the legume crops. So legume crops are crops that have a um, symbiotic relationship with the soil bacteria. And um, what by symbiotic means there's a relationship between the two where both partners and both, both partners benefit from, from the relationship. You see on the right hand side, you see something called inoculant for peas and beans. And what that is, is it looks, just looks like black powder, but you um, generally will pre-soak the, the seed, the beans, the pea seed, 
uh, overnight, and then uh, in the morning, drain the water, pat down with a paper towel the, the, the wet, damp seeds, and, and then put them in the bag and shake it so that the, uh, the, the booster, the, the inoculant, coats the seed and implants the seed. And that's the bacteria, and that bacteria takes atmospheric nitrogen, the nitrogen that you just breathed in, you know, when we breathe, you know, we're obviously concerned with oxygen. But really about 80% of the atmosphere is inert nitrogen. Inert means it doesn't interact with anything, right? But the bacteria will interact with that nitrogen and make it available to the plant. The plant in turn will photosynthesize and produce sugar and give it to the bacteria. And that's what we call a symbiotic relationship where two very different organisms have a uh, relationship where both of them benefit from the relationship. So you want to put some inoculant down when you when you get when you get your plant your peas. Okay, so let's put this into practice here. You're running around thinking about, okay, I'm going to have a turkey, and I'm going to have mashed potatoes and gravy, and um, dressing, and uh, rolls maybe, and maybe uh, I'm, I'm talking about <laughs> my Thanksgiving dinner, and some uh, maybe, maybe some uh, cranberries. Like that's the core dinner. Now we need a couple of vegetable dishes to go along with that. Usually it's just peas and corn uh, uh, kind of thing, all right? But hey, you want to do something different. This is going to be a special dinner. So you're going through the recipe book and, mm, barefoot contessa sauteed carrots. That looks kind of yummy. And uh, uh, yeah, I'd like to see that on my table. Okay, so you decide that, yeah, you're going to surprise everybody, make things kind of special, and put this dish in front of everybody. And they will look at that and say, ah, oh, never had that before. So you walk on down. In, in this particular case, this is either Lowe's or uh, Home Depot. In the nursery department, they have big seed packet um, uh, displays there. And so you go there and uh, you, you go to the Burpee Seed one because, you know, Burpee's kind of a well-known seed company. And you look for carrots, and if you look in the middle, third roll down, um, oh, there's lots of different carrots there. All right. Uh, which one should I pick? Well, you look at it, and, and you see big ones, you see little ones, you see fat ones, you see skinny ones, et cetera. But go beyond the picture, turn it over, and look for days to maturity. So we have one called Ultimate Hybrid, and it's 80 days to harvest. Okay? We've got 87 days before Christmas. So that would be one that we could do for Christmas. But, oh, Thanksgiving is going to be a challenge. Because what did I say, 57 days? To Thanksgiving, and short and sweet is 68 days to harvest. So that's pushing things. Now you can eat baby carrots, so you could still plant these, and they just wouldn't be quite as big, but still perfectly edible, and they would fit our dish. But yesterday, fooling around with these um, uh, my seed catalogs, uh, I found. A 55-day carrot. It's called Little Finger. So, um, unfortunately, I couldn't find Little Finger in the seed packets. So you don't have a picture of it, but you can just jot that down. And probably you wouldn't have to order that. But um, uh, there is a carrot that we can fall in under 57 days. And it's called Little Finger. Okay. So you see that if we're going for Thanksgiving, forget about it for the ultimate hybrid. But if we're going, but short and sweet, 
we got a fighting chance, and with little finger, we should fall right in there. Oh, here's another one. Brussels sprout gratin. That looks kind of enticing there, especially that sauce going, going around that. Uh, yeah, that would, that would be a dish if I put it on the table for Thanksgiving or Christmas that would get some attention. I can see people looking at that and saying, oh, that's different. I got to try that. So you decide, yeah, I'm, go I'm going to do that. They've never seen that before. So one of my favorite, uh, and I, I would suggest that you uh, Google this and go through his catalog, is Johnny's Selected Seeds. And Johnny is based in Albion, Maine. And you would think, why on earth would you want to get a seed catalog from the upper, upper northeast uh, instead of the lower southwest, where we are, kind of thing. And the thing with Johnny's selected seed, Maine has a real short growing season. So uh, because they have a short growing season, Johnny's kind of specializes in things that mature rapidly. So uh, I've always liked uh, Johnny's selected seeds, and he's real big on heirlooms, and um, uh, so um, and none hybrids. And so uh, I, I like that. I like to get his catalog, even though you think, why, why are you getting this catalog? But I'll give you one more example, tomatoes. Right? Everybody likes tomatoes. Everybody eats tomatoes. You almost eat tomatoes every single day. But we have a problem here in the Coachella Valley, and that is not that it's cold, but it gets too hot too quick. After the temperatures hit 105, Tomato pollen dies, and you have a beautiful plant, and it has beautiful flowers, but they never pollinate, and you just have a plant all the rest of the summer uh, kind of thing. Uh, but we don't get, well, at least not lately, uh, or maybe I should say lately, uh, you don't get temperatures of 105 in Albion, Maine. Uh -oh. Although the way things are going, you might. Uh, so I like to get my tomatoes from Johnny's because uh, I can plant it and, and get tomatoes before the heat really hits here kind of thing. And so you may have heard of the burpees and the big boy. Big boy is that big tomato that you slice and put it on your hamburger uh, thing. And, but it's got a long day of some maturity. But there's another one called Early Girl. And Early Girl has a short uh, days to maturity. And it would be the one to plant here, simply because it gets too hot too soon. OK, so you go to Johnny's, and you're looking for Brussels sprouts. Whoops. All right, <laughs> I got ahead of myself. All right, so um, back up, all right. Uh, for Christmas, we got 87 days. Close enough, we will plant Churchill. We will not plant Diablo. Mm -hmm. So switching gears now, let's switch to warm season vegetables. Now here's the big caveat, put an asterisk by, by this. These guys are frost sensitive. Temperature falls below 32, they're dust. They, they freeze and, and uh, they're done, right? So uh, we don't know, uh, every year the winters seem to get warmer and warmer. Uh, so we don't know what this year is gonna bring. We, as with polar vortexes that they, they get back east are perfectly capable of being here in the west where a front comes right down uh, gets uh, on the west side of the Cascades and then the west side of the Sierra Nevadas and, and then it swings into Southern California and we can get some really, really low temperatures when that happens uh, kind of thing. Uh, we harvest the fruit. Oh, we're back up on frost sensitive. 
So if you're planting one of these during the frost season, a note at the bottom, our first frost is somewhere around Thanksgiving weekend. Right? <clears throat> so if you're planting something and aiming for Christmas, then you definitely have a danger of, of frost. And then you have to go into frost protection, which is another whole lecture kind of thing. But there's a number of ways that you can try to protect those plants when a frost comes. Um, you harvest a fruit. So in this case, we have to, it takes time to grow the whole plant. And then we got to have a flower. And then the flower's got to be pollinated. And then you need fruit set. And then finally, fruit ripening. So it's going to add another 20 days or so to your plants to maturity thing. All right, so longer growing season, 60 to 124 days. We generally plant this between August and September, and we're right on the verge of being October. Or in the um, February to March, and generally the last frost is by the end of February, if we get frost kind of thing. So remembering again, number of days between now, today, and Thanksgiving is 57, and between Christmas is 87. It's a time window that we have to work in. Right, and remember, generally, first frost, Thanksgiving weekend. So we'll see what we see this year. So who are these guys? Okay, like I said, harvest of fruit, and there they are. So you've got tomatoes. Um, uh, you see the beef steak there in the upper left. Um, and you see um, uh, the cherry tomatoes in the middle there at the top. Cherry tomatoes will produce faster and ripen much faster than the beef steaks. So often cherry tomatoes would be the ones to grow in the fall. And then you've got peppers. And you got eggplant. Those are the solanaceous fruits. And um, uh, again, you're growing a fruit. So you got to grow the whole plant and then go through the whole pollination and ripening business. And that takes time. And you got the vine crops. So you got your, all your melons and your, uh, your zucchini and your acorn squash and your cucumbers and pumpkins. All of these are the vine crops. And then we also have a little oddball, a legume crop. Again, but in this case, for the summer, it's garden beans. So uh, there's two types of, and I should have said this for peas too, but I, I didn't. There's two types of plants for garden beans and garden peas. One's called bush and one's called pole. Pole beans just keep growing. So you usually have to stake them and, and that those beans just keep growing right up on the, on the stake. Bush beans are faster. They grow to a certain height and, and then they stop growing. So uh, um, they're the ones to grow in the fall a thing. And again, you can use the inoculant uh, on the bean seeds and uh, uh, help them grow better and save yourself a little money. And then we have a couple oddballs here. Sweet corn, all right? Just notice this is in the side, but you plant sweet corn in a block, like you see there. You don't have a single row of corn plants. And that's because corn plants are wind pollinated. And, and so when the wind blows from any direction in a block, the pollen's going to go from the edge over the middle, north, south, east, or west. So that's why we plant in a block. If you plant in a single row and the wind blows this way into the row, you're not going to get any pollen on the end of the row. And, and the same thing if the wind comes on the side this way, that the, the pollen will all just blow all over into the tomatoes or something. Mm. Let's see this. Lemon maple squash. 
Well, I can see that with uh, some melted butter and uh, maybe some cinnamon uh, on that. Uh, yeah, I think if I put that on the uh, holiday uh, dining table, uh, people would be reaching out with their fork to grab a couple of those. You don't know, again, that exclusiveness, you don't normally see that. That looks very appetizing. So you go down back to the burpees thing and, and you take a look at it and say, hmm, which one should I choose for Christmas? And probably because you're probably not going to plant this afternoon, probably a uh, uh, butter bush would do a very, very good job of uh, be, being ready by Christmas time. Welcome, my uh, takes another 10 days uh, to do it. And then easy corn pudding. Well, uh, where I live in, the, in, in our house, uh, we just have kernel corn. Uh, but this looks interesting. Uh, and this might be, again, another thing for you to put on, on, on your table. And people will be sitting around the table and say, oh, what is this? I haven't seen anything like this before. And so I'll say, yeah, that would top things off nicely. So, again, uh, I go to the store and it's Ferry Morris uh, display here. And look at the corns. Uh, down there, uh, the, the fourth and the fifth, and part of the sixth, and even a bit of the seventh. There's a lot of corn to choose from, right? A lot of corn. Big corn, sweet corn, uh, a combination of uh, white corn kernels and uh, uh, yellow corn kernels, super sweet, lots and lots of different varieties kind of thing. But you're looking to be able to harvest the, this thing in time for Thanksgiving. So you turn over each packet and you look for days to maturity and say, which one matures the fastest? And you get one and as an old favorite of mine, way back when I was teaching, uh, my fall students would plant this one. And if you look at that, Early sun goal, 68 days to harvest. And so uh, we can take a shot at, at that one uh, for Thanksgiving, but um, we could certainly have it before uh, Christmas, wait a while to plan it. And then, oh, but Silver Queen, which is a very sweet, sweet corn. Uh, we got 87 days. So if you planted it this weekend, it would fall right, right in there, All right? So the whole point behind this, let's do one more example here. Green bean and mushroom salad kind of thing, all right? I uh, see that's, I think got some onions on it and the uh, uh, walnuts, and I think we have some onions there, and such a, yeah. I like taking a little bites of that. So uh, you take a look at that and say, okay, that's going to go on the two. All right, so you go back back down to Home Depot or uh, uh, Lowe's or one of those stores, and um, uh, there's that BP, BP, <laughs> bur burpy display again, and you look for garden beans. And oh my goodness, you got a ton of beans to choose from, right? But which one matures the fastest? So uh, you'd look at that and you say, Kentucky Wonder, that's an old reliable, but that's 65 days uh, before Thanksgiving, so we're not gonna make it. But um, uh, the one on the left, I'm not even gonna try to pronounce that. I took uh, French twice in junior college, flunked the first time, went to take it a second time, and almost flunked, 
But the teacher got me aside and said, look, Ackley, I'll give you a D minus if you promise never to take a French class again. And so I gratefully took that on my college transcript. There is one D minus kind of thing. But you see, it's 48 days. So you're, you're in good shape uh, uh, for that one. So the whole point about this is you, you got to look at the days to maturity. Now, some things you might do to speed things up. Um, in, in the late fall, uh, you want to warm the soil, so germination will happen uh, quickly. So you can use black plastic mulch cover and put slits in the plastic and have the plant come up. And, and that plastic is going to warm the soil around the plant, and that will speed up ger germination and growth. You can also buy soil heating cables where you run it along the row, and it will warm up the soil and somewhat the plant. Already talked to you about pre-soaking large seeds overnight before planting. When you plant a dry seed, the first three or four days, is the seed doesn't do anything but that hard coat absorbs water. And then it softens, and then the plant can break through. So if you pre-soak, you're going to buy yourself three or four days. All right, and then you can supplement artificial grow lights uh, outdoors using landscape lights. And um, you can also uh, put white boards around the plant and it will reflect sunlight right onto the plant and that'll buy you a little more time. All right, finally, what about using transplants to speed things up? That seems obvious. Why plant a seed when I can plant a plant? And I'll buy myself uh, uh, you know, a, a few days. All right, and, and you can see time to germinate at, at, at different temperatures. So uh, um, if you can eliminate that, even in the worst case for bees, you're gonna buy yourself six days, all right? So you look at that and say, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm in a hurry, so uh, um, I'm going to use the transplant. Problems with this. First of all, not much variety. Uh, you, see, you saw in the seed packets that I displayed, uh, you know, you had six or seven of each of the things that I showed you. But when you go over to the transplants, uh, it's usually just one, maybe two. All right. Secondly, you don't know when the seed that grew to transplant was planted. So days to maturity kind of go out the window. All right. And then there's transplant shock. When you take a plant, a baby plant, out of its container and put it in, in, in the ground, you disturb the roots, and there's a regeneration period of time, which almost nullifies the time you save by planting a plant instead of a seed. So the real solution to this is probably wait till next year, buy yourself one of these very handy seed starting kits, and grow your own transplants. And then when you plant them, Plant them in, in, in one of these fiber cups, pre-soak it a little bit first, and the roots go right through this. And so you have very little transplant shock to have to deal with. All right, those are enticing vegetable dishes and it may have occurred to some of you that, well, I need that recipe. So all those pictures that you saw in my presentation, if you Google 37 best Thanksgiving vegetable dish recipes, you'll find them all right in there. And you'll find other entries too. Okay, so that's it. Good luck. It's, it, it, it's a challenge. You're somewhat at the mercy of, of weather, but you're not harmless. Now you know how, how to pick the ones that have the best chance of making it. And so I wish you success.
So do we have any questions, Stephanie? Hold on, it doesn't look like any questions yet. Um, we'll leave the chat open for just a few minutes. Um, and if anyone has any questions, we'll leave the chat open for just a few minutes. Well then, I guess I had a dynamite lecture that anticipated and answered all your all your questions. Well, it was a complete failure. So we'll just see what 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 happens. But have fun with this. Right? If you, you fail, the grocery store is still there. You can go and get that. I'd like to thank everybody that was able to watch this webinar today. Um, and if you're we're able not to watch it, you can upload it. On, we're going to be uploading it to YouTube uh, maybe in a couple of days. And our next webinar will be November 17th at noon. Uh, the topic is Who's CBWD Big Picture? And for those that are interested in landscaping, uh, we have a lush and efficient book for $10 that can be purchased at our web, on our website at cbwd.org. Look in the section, uh, CBWD store, and it's $10 to purchase. And for anybody that's interested, you can also come in our Ponder's office and pick it up at the counter. Thank you. Have a good day.